So we're just going to launch right into Psalm 119, beginning in verse 33, and uh, with just another little chunk of passage. Aren't you enjoying Psalm 119, going through it very slowly? Uh, the psalmist continues with this same theme in verse 33, where he asks God, God, teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I will keep them to the end. Um, not just to teach me your statutes, but but the way of your statutes. And here the idea is is that of application, not only to be a knower of God's word, but to be a doer of God's word. God, teach me ways to uh, to infuse in my life your statutes and your law. God, in every area of my life, th- there's not an area in our lives that God does not speak to through his word. And so the psalmist here is asking that God would just teach him his statutes, that he would absorb those and they would, uh, they would govern the way of his life, the way he lives his life, the way he thinks, the way he meditates, the way he acts, all of those things that God would just infuse his life. And he asks him in verse 34, God, give me understanding that I may keep your law and observe it with my whole heart. Here when the psalmist is asking for understanding, he's not asking that God would just give me the cognitive or intellectual understanding of his law. But the, the word here, here carries the idea that, that, that in all of his life, he would have a just view of things in relation to the law of God that there would be a wisdom, if you will, how to apply the Word of God. God, give me understanding. And behind that is is kind of, God, give me the why behind your law. Um, let me give you just a brief example. God doesn't arbitrarily just cast out His law in the sense that He says, okay, I think this would be a good thing for, for my people to follow. No, all of His law emanates from His character and his nature. And when when God gives the command, any of the commands, uh, just look at the Ten Commandments. If God gives a command, do not steal. He's, he's not, it's not that he just thought it wouldn't be a good idea, but, but God is incapable of violating that, that standard of righteousness to take what is not rightfully his. And so God knows that in our lives, there's blessings for us to follow the law. When he says, do not steal, it, 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 is, it is good for us. There's a reason why. Well, there are a number of reasons why. Number one, you're, you're violating someone else's right to ownership. And God would never violate the right to ownership. And so his law comes from, so give me understanding of your law to observe it with my whole heart. Here that phrase is again. He repeats this phrase over and over in Psalm 119, that with our whole heart, not half-heartedly, not with a divided heart, but with a whole heart longing after God's word to understand it and apply it in our lives. Then he says, lead me in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Lead me, direct me in the path, in the way of your commandments. This is a good prayer for us to pray. God, lead me in a way towards your commandments. It's kind of the opposite of what Jesus taught us in uh, in the Sermon on the Mount of how we should pray. God, lead me not into temptation. Lord, lead me away from temptation. And we can add this to it. God, not only lead me away from temptation, but God, Lead me in the path of righteousness. Uh, let me interrupt for just a second. Joan, we, we did uh, pray for you. Well, we're praying for you this morning and praying for Ken as well. Um, I've, I've informed everybody of Ken's condition this morning, and so we're praying for Ken to have a speedy recovery and praying for strength for you too, Joan. We love you and, and just know that we're praying for you. And so back to Psalm 119, verse 36. He says, God, incline my heart to your testimonies and not to selfish gain. Now, here he uses a contrast. We all have inclination towards things. And so here the psalmist is praying, God, 
give me an inclination, incline my heart, draw my heart to your testimonies, your faithfulness, your word, oh God, and not to selfish gain. We have that flesh that we contend with on a daily basis, don't we? And the flesh is always driving us to things that are selfish gain, things that are self-serving. Um, and so here he's praying, God, incline my heart, God, to your testimony, to the will of your testimony, to the testimony of your will, and not to those things that would be selfish gain. Another way of putting that would be, God, incline my heart that I would, I would have the heart that to God be the glory, great things he had done, that we would have a heart that's inclined to him. Then he says in verse 37, and this is linked to verse 36, turn my eyes from looking at worthless things and give me life in your ways. Here he's literally praying, God, turn my eyes from looking at worthless things or things that are vain. It's true. The more we gaze upon those things that are vain, the more our heart is inclined to those this Christmas season, we're going to be flooded with advertising. Well, we already have been flooded with it. And, and there is a, there's a science behind marketing to cause us to be drawn with our eyes, to, to see things and to, to dwell on those. And the more we fix our eyes and our gaze on those, the more we will forget the principles of God and be drawn and we'll do whatever it takes, even rack up credit and pay our debtor, our, our creditors, enormous interest rates just so we can have that thing. And so here the prayer is, God, incline my eyes. God, quicken in my heart by the Holy Spirit to turn from those things that, that, that are worthless, that have no eternal value, and give me life in your ways. Confirm to your servant your promises that you may be feared. Um, confirm to me your promises. We are all prone to doubt and skepticism. And the enemy loves to throw in doubt and skepticism towards the promises and the truths of God that he has manifested through his word. And so here the psalmist says, God, when I'm in that state where, where I might want to doubt God, when I, I might want to be skeptical of what your word says or, or your prince, precepts are or your counsel, uh, or the wisdom through your word, God, confirm to me the truth and the value of your word and, and the worthiness of your word and the steadfastness and the firmness of your word that you may be feared, the fear of the Lord is to begin, that you might be reverenced, God, and reverenced above all other things. God, verse 39, turn away the reproach that I dread, for your rules are good. Now, every one of us at some point uh, have come under reproach, either from family members or co-workers or, or others because of our faith in God and our walk and our obedience to him and being a disciple of Christ. And so God, he's praying, God, turn me away from the reproach. God, don't let that reproach affect me. And isn't it true that when we come under that sense of reproach, we either we can get defensive and belligerent, <laughs> I've seen in cases, or we can shrink back. And so here the psalmist's prayer is, God, when I come under reproach for, for following after you, God, for desiring to live a righteous and pious life, God, turn away your approach. God, I dread it, for your rules are good. And then he concludes this stanza in verse 40. Behold, I long for your precepts. In your righteousness, give me life. As the deer pants for the water, David wrote. So my soul longs for you. God, I long for your precepts. God, I long to know your precepts. I long to know your word. I long to see your beauty and your majesty and all that you are in your splendor through your word. Is that your heart's desire today? 
then pray and ask God. I'm confident that that's a prayer he will answer. God, we long to know you. Lord, we long to know you so that we might be able to make you known. Ask God to increase your passion for him. Ask God for a desire to grow more in him. Can I say this? There are no bounds to our growing in the knowledge of God. Not just a conceptual knowledge, but a knowledge of God, to know him. I have been a believer now, I guess, 36 years. And, and it fascinates me every day when I read the Word of God. And it can be a passage that is very familiar to me. It can be a passage that I can quote forward and backwards. But when I meditate it, uh, meditate on it, chew on it, bring it into my soul, oh my goodness, there is nothing like it. The Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. And we find that through the Word, but we need the Holy Spirit of God to lead us. And so along with that desire for God to grow in us, pray and ask God to fill you with the Holy Spirit today, that you'd be yielded to Him, and the Holy Spirit would give you understanding and nourish our hungry souls with the Word of God. I love you. I pray God's blessings on you today. I pray that uh, you'll have a great Thanksgiving. Uh, there's so much for us to be thankful for and that uh, you'll express that with a heart uh, to God and give him the glory for all of that. I do pray that uh, those of you that are able to join us physically will be here this Sunday morning. Uh, we got a special service lined up for this Sunday. I think you're going to enjoy time in song and, and testimony through his word just to worship him together as a body. If you're not able to be here present, then make it a point to sit down in your den, your living room, gather your friends, your family, hit that share button, start a watch party through Facebook, whatever you can do um, to engage people in the worship of the Lord this weekend, 10 a.m. Sunday morning. And reminder, this is a family worship service this weekend, uh, meaning that our kids, uh, K through uh, K through 12, all of our kids will be present the whole time in the worship service. Um, there is preschool for you early uh, childhood parents, and so that we will have the preschool, but no small groups. Our small groups, again, have been, have been postponed until further notice, and uh, so I love you, and I pray God's blessing. Hit that share button this morning. Have a great day.